Oh, I see some masks. <laughs> Somebody is trying to get in. Hi, everyone. We're just waiting a, a couple more seconds. A few people are still coming into the room. Okay. All right, everyone. Welcome to another virtual presentation brought to you by the Book of Chamber. Thank you for joining us on this uh, afternoon. Well, yeah, four o'clock this late afternoon. Um, we are so excited to have our speaker here. I know um, a lot of people are, are excited to hear what she has to say because everybody's kind of going stir crazy right now with our quarantine. But before we get to our speaker, I'm going to have Sophia go over a little bit of a uh, Zoom tutorial for the newbies. Sophia. Hi everybody, welcome. Um, just a few things to mention. This whole presentation will be recorded and will be available on our YouTube list and we will also be emailing out the slides of this presentation. Um, and everyone is muted upon entry and will remain muted for the presentation until we get to the Q&A. Once we get to the Q&A, um, either you can vocalize your question by raising your hand virtually in the chat room, which is at the bottom of your screen, there's a little chat option. Um, you can raise your hand and I'll call on you, or you can just type in your answer in the chat box. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Sophia. So without further ado, it gives me the great pleasure to introduce Michelle Parkman. Michelle has worked in the EAP field since 1999 in various roles, including Director of Account Management, Business Development, Sales Marketing, National Affiliate Manager. As a licensed mental health counselor, Ms. Parkman has provided counseling to individuals, couples, and families. She has provided a worksite based support groups on a variety of topics, including cancer support, support for the caregiver, and weight management, including pre and post bariatric surgery. She received her master's and specialist degree from the University of Florida in counseling education. Ms. Parkman is certified in the Myers Briggs Type Indicator and has developed and conducted wellness seminars for a variety of industries and professionals on a broad array of topics. She has volunteered in the community to raise awareness of mental health for youth and organizations. She was a coach for Girls on the Run and has served on the advisory council of a nonprofit called Stronger Than Stigma, focused on mental health advocacy for millennials. She has provided keynote talks, including one, of, one for the Jacksonville Business Journal's Ultimate HR Awards on work-life balance. Ms. Parkman is a past recipient of the Jacksonville Business Journal Healthcare Hero Award. So without further ado, Michelle. Thank you so much. And I just am so appreciative of being here today, being with all of you, and I appreciate your time. And uh, there's a lot of collective wisdom on this call from all of you because this is one time in our lives where we are truly all impacted and we are all affected. So we are all living through this and my hope is that um, you could come away with some reminders from the time that we have and I look forward to responding to any questions you might have at the end of our time today. So let's go to um, the next slide. And I entitled this presentation, This Too Shall Change. And um, I don't know if anybody on the call ever heard of a guy named Colin O'Brady. But Colin O'Brady was the first person to cross Antarctica. And he did it, obviously, that was his choice. <laughs> and um, he came up with a couple of mantras that were significant to him during that time. And one of them was, this too shall change. And he attributes that to getting him through really dark times through that trek. And I think that's such a relevant mantra for all of us to keep in mind because things change. Things are changing for us all the time, daily sometimes with news and information. And certainly on a week to week basis, we're all figuring out how long is this going to last? And um, I took this picture, actually. Um, it was one of those things that oftentimes you see at the beach advertising for smoothies. It's really hard to see. 
I've never seen it near my home before. So I was thinking, okay, that's good marketing at the time where we're all staying home. Now they're kind of spreading out, um, not just centering marketing to the beach. So it, things are changing for all of us, the way we're doing business, the way the chamber's doing business. Um, we are all tapping in to create creative ways to get our message out there. So um, I really want to talk a lot about practicing self-care and attending to our mental health during this time together. If we go to the next slide, the next slide shows, um, once we get there, um, first of all, I know that for some, you may be working from home where your kids may be home. Um, so again, I like this disclaimer of no one apologizes when their kids interrupt the conference call today, <laughs> mine included. So I put that in there just as much for me as for everyone else. Let's go to the next slide. So one of the things that um, I just wanted to show you a snapshot of the things I have planned for the next 45 minutes that we have together today. And you can see it's a lot around self-care, boundary setting, coping tools, and there's things on here about gratitude and things on here about virtual celebration. And one of the things we'll talk about a little bit too is some awareness building around stress fractures and I'll explain more of what that is. If we go to the next slide, it's a lot of feeling emojis. I believe. And uh, with these feeling emojis, what I want, what I ask you to do, if you can, is to type in the chat box right now. Um, once the slide comes up and uh, really identify, I just want to know from you one word that describes how you're feeling right now, literally in this moment, just one word. So if you're able to, feel free to just chat. Make sure it's um, to everyone. I think it's set for all of us on to everyone. And feel free to just identify the feeling in that chat box if you can. And even if you can't, um, I have probably been talking to about 35 people a week most of which has been very centered around uh, COVID-19. And as some of you can see right now, um, some of the feelings that have come up are tired, numb, anxious, caged, drained, exhausted, okay, not great, but okay, and confused and grateful and excited about what's to come and thankful. So I love that. Um, but I really want to validate, you know, as a therapist, that's what I'm prone to do anyway. We talk about feelings probably all day long and to be able to validate each of those. And you can see they're on a continuum from tired, exhausted, drained to grateful and thankful. And they change sometimes hour to hour, moment to moment, which is perfectly normal, we're all living that. So just because we set an intention for the day, if this is how I wanna feel, we vary in terms of that feeling. It's very difficult to hold on to a feeling. The good news is that feelings have a beginning and an end and may change. Going back to this too shall change. And so when we're experiencing a negative feeling, I think it's important for us to recognize we don't have to avoid it because oftentimes I liken it to we try to avoid feelings. It's almost like what happens when you submerge a beach ball in water. It only kind of comes back and um, hits you in the face. <laughs> That's kind of what happens when we're trying to avoid feelings or we try to use things to numb feelings. And I think what's an important reminder right now is that feelings are temporary. They might come back and repeat themselves. But if we don't allow ourselves to begin feeling it, we don't give ourselves an opportunity to end that feeling. So bear that in mind as we talk about self-care and let's go to the next slide. So 
And thank you for those that shared. I'm going to ask that same question again at the end of our time today. Okay, so we're going to go to the next slide. And this is just a reminder that there is no right way or wrong way to feel. But if we go to the next slide, there's an image that I absolutely love, which is an image that reminds us to keep our buckets full. And that's super important now more than ever. And what I'm gonna do is just tap into slides because it's hard for me to see what's coming. So I'm gonna try to do that. But um, while I'm doing that, keeping your bucket full, as you'll see on the slide soon, represents the fact that we, you know, if you picture yourself as a bowl, right? And, um, and let's say there's a glass in the bowl. So let's say you're the glass in the bowl. If you fill up your glass, that's gonna trickle out to the bowl. And let's say the bowl represents your loved ones and people that you're caring for right now. We gotta have a full glass in order for us to give. And something that hasn't changed is the importance of this. So the focus being on sleep, on nutrition, and on recovery allows that bucket to be filled so then we can give, whether it's through work, school, and when we make those withdrawals on stress, as long as we have these deposits coming in from the sleep and nutrition and recovery, then we have things to give. Otherwise, we're completely on empty. So to me, whether I would be talking to you about self-care two months ago or now, this has not changed. And I really um, encourage you all. And it's easier said than done, right? We all, I mean, sleep for all of us, I think it's challenging. And so we'll talk a little bit about that as well. Let's go to the next slide. This next slide just talks about the multiple new roles that we have gotten ourselves into because of COVID-19 and because of social distancing. So some of us now, and believe me, I think our pets are enjoying this if you do have pets at home, but we have become short order cooks during the lunch hour. For those of you that have children in the home, um, we have become homeschool or remote distance learning consultants. We have um, experienced for many a financial impact and a lot of uncertainty. And so it becomes even more crucial at a time like this to identify and communicate what our boundaries are. We are not limitless and we've never been through this before. And so being able now more than ever to identify what my boundaries are, how much can I take, what is it that I need for myself to replenish when you are sheltering in place with a supportive family, it's hard enough to do this. When you're sheltering in place with when there's a lot of tension to begin with, it's even harder. So I want to acknowledge that. But let's go to the next slide. This is just, um, this next slide just depicts the change that has happened, the evolution between remote schooling, um, you know, where our kids were learning whatever math they were learning before, and now we are in charge for those of you that are homeschooling right now. And to me, the focus really is on flexibility, not perfection. And for some of us, it's really hard if you already have a perfectionistic attitude. So whether it's you have children at home or whether you don't, but regardless of, of what's happening right now, I just talked to somebody where they shared with me, they feel like they're not doing enough. You know, they're working from home and they constantly feel like they should be doing more. So really being able right now to focus on flexibility, not perfection. If we go to the next slide, it's a little bit more about the importance of boundary setting. So these are just some reminders. And I would love to hear from you at the end of this for those that have either successfully set boundaries or for those that are struggling a little bit to do so. The reminders that no one is a mind reader. 
you know, I think this is a really important thing, um, regardless of what's going on. I and mean, then I probably say it multiple times a day to folks, but no one knows what it is that you're thinking, what it is that you're needing, unless you speak up. I used to facilitate a group on a college campus and the ground rules were ask for what you want 100% of the time. It doesn't mean you're gonna get it, but if you don't ask for it, you won't know. And just like you, other people have the right to say no. So keeping that in mind and you know, unless you're expressing not just what it is that you need, but sometimes it's important to express why you need it. So for those that are cooped up with family members and it's getting stifling to be able to not just say, I need my space, but to be able to say why, because otherwise it gets taken so personally. So being able to say, you know, I'm realizing that my I just, I'm, my batteries are drained. I'm not in a good place. This has nothing to do with you. It has everything to do with me. But I just, I, I find myself needing some space so then I can operate better. Um, otherwise, others don't know. And we all have a, a need, even our kids as they grow, a need for space and a need for privacy. And right now, it's really challenging, but being able to do your best to, um, to figure out and identify where space and privacy could come from. Um, I've been on webinars in the last couple of weeks where people talked about they hang a sign. So it's like that stop sign or something on the door or something near their workspace which communicates, I'm on a call, I'll get to you in a little bit. So being creative with that. The other thing um, that I would say in any kind of relationship workshop is a basic communication block is I feel blank, when blank, because blank, I would like. Let me break that down a little bit. To be able to start off being able to say, I feel. I feel angry, I feel confused, I feel drained, I feel caged, all of these really poignant words that you all identified here. To be able to communicate that because truthfully, you own that feeling. You're not blaming somebody else for that feeling, you're taking responsibility for that feeling. Um, I feel caged when. And so what you're doing there is after when, give a fact. Um, you know, if you say, you know, I feel anxious when you're going around the house with Clorox wipes and not able to let me have my space, that's a, you know, there's, there's some fact in that. I am anxious, I feel anxious when you're going around the house with Clorox wipes all. Okay, this may, by the way, not be the best of examples, but I'm doing my best to convey the point. Versus, I feel anxious when you are going around like a crazy person. Okay, so one is about an opinion, which really doesn't have much validity and is going to completely cause an argument because that's perception and opinion, whereas the other is just a fact. So I feel blank when and then follow it up with a fact, because, and what you're saying after the because is you're sharing with the other person the impact that their behavior is having on you. And going back to nobody's a mind reader, we don't realize the impact that we have on each other unless it's known, unless it's spoken. And then I would like, that's just an assertive statement after the fact. So being able to set boundaries, being able to say no, oftentimes we don't Think about this part, but when you say no to somebody or someone, you're saying yes to yourself. For those of you that have children, maybe not as much now, maybe we're getting used to this, but probably a couple of weeks ago, maybe your children were still asking to hang out with some friends. Come on, it's gonna be fine. Um, you know, when we say no, we are saying yes to our safety. We are saying yes to protecting those that are vulnerable. So no is sometimes difficult, but the things that prevent us from saying no are fear, guilt, and self-doubt. So that's a, that's a really important facet right now. Um, just the next slide is something that um, somebody shared on Facebook. And I thought it was really, um, poignant in the fact that it was very real. You know, we can all relate. There was some good, there was some bad. Ugh, um, oh, I was all over the 
place today, thrilled about news that my daughter and her spouse are expecting their first baby, frustrated with the unemployment site for crash and crime because we don't have jobs, terrified, and then she talks about walking and yoga and doing dance and chatting, and, and that helped her, and then knowing she yelled at everyone in her house, knowing that she walked in the neighborhood, and she had some great surprises that came up for her, and that tomorrow's a new day and a new opportunity. And I think this also shows kind of the waves. It's almost like waves of grief. And we're gonna talk about grief in a little bit. They're, they don't happen in nice little packages and in, in order. Um, it's very fluid, it's very, very ever-changing. And a lot of times both are true. I can feel scared, I can feel anxious, and I can feel grateful. So that's a very important thing um, as well when it comes to the things that you all shared with the feeling work. So, I'm just pointing at that. And then the next slide talks about what contributes to our response. You know, we all are on a different part of a continuum in a lot of different ways. Our mental health, to me, mental health, just like physical health, is on a continuum. And we're in all different places with that. Um, so I think a lot of things go into uh, how we're responding to this. Um, one of the things I think is Outlook. There's a great book that came out probably in 1980 by Martin Seligman. Michelle, we've lost you a little bit. Can you hear me? when we are the oldest sibling and there's some Michelle yeah we lost you for about 30 seconds okay <laughs> sorry about that no it's okay when um did you hear anything about this slide we kind of lost what you were saying about 30 seconds of what you were saying okay well what I was saying is a lot goes into um our response um our outlook which is about whether we're optimistic or pessimistic, the way we um, explain things to ourselves, that goes into it. Um, our role in our family sometimes could even play a part in how we're responding to social distancing. If we were the oldest, um, for those of you, you know, I can't see you right now, but if I were to say, raise your hand, one hand, if you were an oldest sibling, and then if you raise another hand, if you are an over-functioner, when things get anxiety provoking, um, it might look like you're on a roller coaster. So a lot of times when we're the oldest, not always, but sometimes when we're the oldest sibling, we tend to over-function during times of high stress. Um, in the beginning, Chastity mentioned about me being certified in Myers-Briggs type indicator. That's one of those things that many, probably a lot of you have taken in the course of your career. Um, that first component is whether you're introverted or extroverted, and that can play a part in how well you're functioning with social distancing. If you are very much on the scale of introverted, where that has nothing to do with shyness, by the way, and everything to do with the fact of where you get your energy, then some people have embraced social distancing with arms wide open because it has been beautiful for many people in terms of not having to deal with a lot of putting out their energy in the outside world. Um, for those of you that are high on the extroversion scale, maybe not so much. And again, these are not um, prescriptive by any, any means because this could, I've talked to, to people about this and they've said, well, I am introverted, but I'm really sick of this. So um, that definitely is not prescriptive. Love languages, for those that are aware of um, the five love languages by Gary Chapman. Um, he, he breaks things up. He says the way we receive love is the way we tend to give love. And um, he has categories like quality time, gifts, um, acts of service, and so on. And so for those that feel loved when they get to spend quality time with their family, this might be depending on who you're sheltering with, this could be a really important time that taps into that for you, or it could be a very isolating time if you don't get that. And then certainly issues that were already issues before, and it may have been easier um, prior to a month ago to avoid some of those things may be coming out for you. So a lot contributes to our response. If we go to the next slide, 
I just wanted to bring out a couple of quotes that I thought are really um, relevant for today. One is a Viktor Frankl quote. For those that are aware of Viktor Frankl, for those that are not, he was a Holocaust survivor. He um, began a whole theory in psychology called logotherapy. He was a psychologist and neurologist, and he did his work based on what he observed in four different concentration camps that he survived. And what his quote was is that everything can be taken from a man, but one thing, the last of human freedoms to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances. So what he reminds us is that no matter what is happening externally, we all have the power to choose our attitude. And that's incredibly powerful, especially at a time like this. The other one is a Buddhist quote, which is pain is inevitable, suffering is optional. Pain is inevitable, suffering is optional. Meaning, you know, it's inevitable for us to have pain. We're going to be talking about that. Some of us are experiencing grief as we sit here, um, whether it's COVID related or not COVID related. Um, but suffering is something that we have an option about. And the more we practice self-care, the more important that is. I end this slide with an acronym called Yahoo. And I had a colleague that said, Yahoo stands for you always have other options. You always have other options. And I think at the crux of depression, at the crux of anxiety, those two things in particular, we oftentimes feel like we have no option. And so it's really important and powerful to remind ourselves we absolutely do have options. We have options on where to focus our energy and our attitude. So going to the next slide, I ask the question, what am I practicing? What am I practicing? Because what we tend to practice, we tend to get better at. I put a flute on this next slide. Um, it will pop up in a little bit. The reason I put a flute is to me, the flute was always my exception. I um, practiced the flute growing up. I was awful at it, horrible at it. Um, I got accused of not practicing it. It was awful. So there's exceptions to every rule. But aside from that, typically, what we spend time on, what we practice, we get really good at. And so being able to ask yourself, even on a daily basis or maybe a couple times a day, what am I practicing today? Because that's something. Michelle? Uh-oh. Michelle? Michelle? Yes. Michelle? We lost you again. Oh, my gosh. And where did you lose me? <laughs> Probably about, like, 15 seconds of your comments. Um, what, why do you um, have the flute? <laughs> okay. So um, thank you, just to be able to recognize that what you practice, you typically get better at. And so being able to ask, ask the question throughout the day, what, am I, what do I want to be practicing? And then the next slide is CBT strategy. So CBT stands for Cognitive Behavioral Therapy. And Cognitive Behavioral Therapy is um, what is pretty well researched when it comes to um, treating depression, anxiety. Aaron Beck is one of the founding fathers of that. And it really stresses the importance of our thoughts as one thing, that if we can change our thoughts, we can change everything. And what I've been telling people probably over and over, and even before um, COVID-19, is be a curious observer instead of a critical judger. Just observe, if you are feeling, and I, I appreciate all these comments that I'm seeing too in the chat, um, you know, basically to be able to just observe, observe your own response to it instead of critically judge that. The next acronym, and I deal a lot with acronyms because they make it easy for me to remember. HALT is an interesting one. We'll talk about it more um, with, when I talk about eating, which I do in this slideshow here, but HALT stands for, am I hungry? Okay, so 
you know, we joke, I mean, in the beginning of all of this, I saw a lot of things on news feeds and posts that say, you know, I'm gaining the COVID-19. I mean, you know, it's hard. We're at home. And if food is something that has given you comfort um, way before this, it's certainly not going to be any different right now. And so um, being able Sorry, guys. I think um, Michelle's having just a little bit of Wi-Fi challenges here. Let's see if she comes back on. We're stressed. L is, am I lonely or depressed? He is, am I Hi, Michelle. We keep losing you. Oh, I'm so sorry. That's I don't okay. know. Yeah. Um, I'm really speaking such brilliant things. I'm, I'm <laughs> saying that, you know. I think it's brilliant, but I'm the only one to my party, apparently, if nobody can hear me. Um, false, I was just going through, am I hungry? And did you hear any of that? You heard the hungry part. Okay. A is, am I anxious or stressed? L is, am I lonely or depressed? And T is, am I tired or bored? And so just like that initial activity about what am I tapping into? What's feeling? What am I really feeling? To me, that's such an important exercise because we often find ourselves disconnecting from ourselves. And that's when a lot of unhealthy and destructive behaviors um, occur. So being able to be mindful and going back to observe, what am I? Because each one could have a plan. If I'm anxious or stressed, can I take a walk? If I'm lonely um, or depressed, can I call a friend? Can I video chat? Am I tired or bored? Can I take a nap? So, you know, really tapping into things that are actually going to address the feeling rather than just numbing. Um, smile also, and this goes back to that recovery slide, that, you know, keeping a full bucket. Am I getting enough sleep? Am I moving? Am I connecting with other people? Am I laughing? And am I hydrating? I think those things, if you just have to do the bare minimum right now, those are the things to check in with. Safety and privacy, I already talked about how important that is. Normalizing the grief that we feel. There's been a lot of losses. We'll talk about that in a minute. And having realistic expectations for self and others. There's a little picture on this slide that says, must you, must you always be so negative? A battery talking to a negative battery. So being able to be realistic. If somebody was negative before, they're going to be negative now. Um, there's things that they can change about that, but you certainly can't make them change about that. Um, and then this sounds very Dr. Phil. It probably comes from him initially. You know, Dr. Phil is big on saying, how's that working for you? Well, it's important to say what's not working for you and to be able to, if you choose to, to write it down, what's not working for you. So then you can find options for those solutions because you cannot change what you don't acknowledge. So these are some strategies, um, some tools for your toolbox. If we go to the next slide. The next slide talks about tips for social distancing. And I think a lot of um, us by now may have been exposed to some of these um, good tips, but I think they're, they bear repeating to create structured and dedicated workspace for those that have to balance working from home, um, to build self-care into the routine, to um, build a routine and structure in the face of uncertainty. That's really helpful for many people that rely on structure otherwise. Um, and I saw this and I thought, you know, dressing for the social life you want. You know, we, we've joked, we've said, you know, I put on, Sorry, guys, we lost her again. Michelle? Okay, I see that it, there's a message here that says my internet connection. Yep, you lost me. I lost yeah. you. Yep. We heard to the part of the joke. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Great. Um, some people would wish that wasn't the case. All right. so. Um, dressing for the social life that we want, taking regular breaks, including lunchtime, um, to follow up uh, 
and this to me is very important, and I've experienced this firsthand, you know, to me, going to the grocery store right now is becoming more and more anxiety provoking. So if you know you have to do something that is anxiety provoking, if possible, it's not always possible, but try to follow that up with a relaxation oriented activity after that. Um, I think being able to alternate between. Um, you know, if you find grocery store shopping incredibly stressful right now, you do it, and then all of a sudden, you're asked to um, get on a call, on a work call, or you have to make a hard decision right after that, your cortisol hasn't had a chance to return to baseline. That's the primary stress hormone. So you're going to feel it, and it's going to really take you probably further into the day with, with a very stressful demeanor. So being able to alternate. And then um, integrate video into conversations as desires. You know, again, depending on your introverted extroversion or just your desire and how that feels for you. Some of you on this call may have had, maybe experiencing a lot of Zoom meetings. And for some, it leads them to feel more satisfied. And for some, it leads them to feel less satisfied. So just tap into that. So when you're doing these personal things, you, you kind of develop what your preferences are. We're going to go to the next slide. And this next slide is a reminder very quickly. We'll go through the next slides very quickly. One is about the importance of getting into nature if you can, right? Just being exposed to nature, just being even if you're looking at a through a window right now, how important that is. There's there was a study done at Stanford University where they took two groups of um, two groups of walkers. There were 90 people in each group. And they found that there were changes in neural activity. So in the prefrontal cortex, where we do a lot of rumination when we're anxious, there was a huge reduction in that after following people that have walked in nature that just exposed themselves to the outdoors. So that is super important when you can and when you're safe to do so. We're going to go to the next slide, the importance of moving. And again, there's so many benefits to exercise and to just moving, even if it's for five minutes. And um, there's increased energy. We hopefully get a better sleep. We have a little bit more mental sharpness. There was a study done at Harvard where they um, increased activity for 35 minutes for people that had a genetic predisposition or history of depression, and they found that it reduced the risk of future episodes. So there's a lot of good research out there that ties into these things. If we go to the next slide, for those of you that are Brene Brown fans, I don't know if anybody's heard of her, I highly recommend she does a great podcast right now called Unlocking Us. She's written so many books over the last few years and she's a researcher that's done, and a professor in Texas, she's done a lot of qualitative research on things like shame and vulnerability. And the thing she talks about is calm. She says that calm can be something we choose, something we practice, and it is as contagious as anxiety. And so it goes back to curiously observing versus critically judging. Don't confuse what's possible with what is probable. And she talks about fear, fear being so common right now. But fear is still sometimes disproportionate. Um, John Gordon, who's another author who I really appreciate, talks about fear standing for false evidence appearing real. And I think that's a really important thing to remember, you know, even though this is a time that fear is very normal, but I think also tracking ourselves to say, is this over proportionate to what's happening right now? And just check in with yourself about that. Stay on today, one day at a time. A panic response produces more panic. You know, she talks about two questions she asks herself. This is Brene Brown. She talks, she says, do I have enough data to freak out? And number two, will freaking out help even if I have enough data? <laughs> and the answer is no. So being able to just tap into that for yourself too. And she talks about the importance and the beauty of you got to name it to tame it. You got to name it to tame it. So if you are around other people and you're feeling anxious to be able to own it and say, I think I'm in anxiety right now. I'm not talking about clinical. I'm talking about human. So being able to tap into that for yourself and to allow other people to know what's going on with you right now, it really can um, catch yourself getting into arguments because oftentimes we act out what we don't express. So keeping that in mind, if we go to the next slide, there's a great article, by the way, on applying the 12 steps 
to what's happening in our lives right now for those that are familiar with any 12-step program. And one of the things that's at the crux of 12-step program is that, that um, mantra, that serenity prayer, they talk about acceptance for what we can't control, the wisdom to know the difference, focus on what we can. And so, you know, this might be a common picture for those folks who, okay, I can control organizing. That's something I can do. So some people are really happy to take everything out of their pantry right now and to organize it and to use the time to do that. Some people are saying, are you kidding me? That's the last thing I'm going to do. But it goes to the point of recognizing what you have control over and things that you don't have control over and being able to focus on those things that we do. If we go to the next slide, I mentioned Martin Seligman's Learned Optimism book a little bit ago. He talks about the three P's of pessimism. He said, one of the P's is personalization. He says, going back to his theory is that this is all about how we explain something. When something bad happens, what our explanatory style is. So sometimes we might personalize it. Something bad happens, we say to ourselves, oh, oh things always bad. Bad things always happen to me. It's me. So this is personal and recognizing that nothing is personal. Um, pervasiveness, when we tell it, when something bad happens and we say, this is affecting my whole entire being, my whole entire life. And I think we've seen good examples where even though there's so much grief happening right now, we can still experience grief and joy. We can experience joy and pain. And I think that's a very important thing to recognize that they are not mutually exclusive. We can have both. Um, and then what, and then permanent is just that. It's thinking that these things, this is never going to get better. This is going to be our lives forever. This is never going to change. Anything, really, anything but death is temporary. Death and taxes, I usually say. Um, so being able to recognize the importance that things are temporary, things change, this too shall change. So if we go to the next slide, I know we're about out of time. I just want a um, couple of things to add to it. One is when to seek professional help. And um, what I say about that is there is, you can seek professional help at any time. Thankfully, professional help for mental health right now is coming in um, the form of telehealth. So many, many therapists right now, whether it's through your insurance plan, whether you're with a company that has an employee assistance program, we're doing telehealth. So there's nothing too big or too small to seek some help for. These are some things that you know might lend itself to a little bit more severe. If you're not able to sleep, if you have severe appetite disturbance, if you feel withdrawn, you can see this slide. Disillusionment, if you're hearing things that aren't there, seeing things that aren't there, um, interference with daily activities for several days in a row, if you have thoughts of death or suicide. I mean, these are things, you know, if you're using nicotine, food, drugs, alcohol to cope with difficult emotions, these are all examples of being further down the continuum. But I really implore and encourage anybody that it's never too early. There's nothing too big or too small to seek therapy about. And um, this next slide, Let's do two slides from now, and I'm going to wrap it up, and then we'll have time for questions. Um, the power of words, going to the power of words, which is the next slide. Um, to me, I go back to that CBT stuff. It's so powerful. So if you think about the way you are talking, whether it's thoughts about yourself, thoughts about what's happening in the world right now, have to versus get to. We have the choice and we can focus on the things, you know, it's very easy to say, I have to. I have to do this homeschooling with my kid. I have to check in with such and such. But the truth is we get to. So it's being able to focus on what we get to add, not what we have to give up. And I think that's a really important distinction right now to keep us coping, to keep us going. Um, there was great research that came out years ago from the Center of Healthy Minds out of Wisconsin. They did a study about happiness, and they took two groups, a control group and experimental group at work, and they came up with 531. And they said after a year, they saw significant improvement in happiness with the group that for five, they did five minutes of mindful meditation. Three is that they um, 
wrote down three things that they're grateful for every night. And Adam Grant, who's an industrial psychologist, he also offers, along with the things that you're grateful for, write down one way that you made a positive impact each day. Even during a time like this, write down one way you've made a positive impact today. And then the one is to be able to do, um, to pay it forward, to do a, a, a good deed for somebody else. Even if that is to make a quick call, to um, do a FaceTime with some older relatives that you haven't spoken to in a while, whatever it is, or relatives across the country that you haven't seen, um, it's so impactful. And so I just wanted to, um, again, really bring that to fruition. The one thing I do want to um, also add to the next slide, the power of words. Going back to that, the word and versus the word or. Okay, I go back to saying you can have joy and you can have pain, both are true. And I thought this was really poignant to say, yes, we can feel grateful and disappointed about things being canceled. Yes, we can enjoy extra time with loved ones and feel overwhelmed by their presence. So that's a really important thing to um, bear in mind. Um, and then I also call it even those statements. So giving yourself permission to reduce shame and acknowledge truth. It's not about all or nothing. Both things can be true. And I think that's a really important thing to remember um, to hold both is true. And I know I'm going to give my slides um, to, to attendees today. So I do, I do want to jump down to a slide that says safety, not just from the coronavirus. And I just want to acknowledge this as we're all on the call, and then we'll wrap up and we'll talk question. But, you know, for some people, it's called safety, not just from Corona. Um, for some people right now, and I think we probably have heard this in the news over the last couple of weeks, domestic violence and abuse, um, suicidal ideation, addiction, grief, loneliness. These are things that with social distancing, unfortunately, sometimes it really ramps up the things that were already fractured within families, within people. And so um, this may not necessarily be the time to solve these things, but it is the time to do what you can to get through these things. And so this presentation today also includes some resources that I think are super important. I have to say that the domestic violence shelters are open. They're accepting people. Um, as we talked about therapy, they're doing telehealth. Addiction, there are 12-step programs that are offering online right now. And so there are so many options right now, so many options of ways to deliver services. And I just want to make sure people are aware of those. So I'm going to stop um, and, and open it up for questions. Hi, Michelle. We actually had a question um, from a little bit earlier. Yeah. So one of our viewers said, my position requires me to be on the road a lot. Now being home, I'm getting my work done a lot quicker and almost feel guilty. How do you handle that? So I go back to what I said before. There is nothing wrong with, just because, this is poignant, I want everybody to listen up to this one. Just because you feel guilty doesn't mean you are guilty. Just because you feel guilty doesn't mean you are guilty. Um, it's totally normal. To feel guilty. I really think that a lot of what's going to come out of this time are some innovation, creative ways to deliver services we didn't do before. And so there might be things that, um, you know, employers recognize that could be done from home. So I think just take note, tell your story, keep talking in the life of communication open with um, the person you report to about the accomplishments and, and the productivity that you're having because they tell a story and you, we don't know what's to come after this. But I think, um, you know, I think it's an incredibly normal thing, but I just want people to remember just because they feel guilty doesn't mean they are. I hope that helps. If there's any follow-up questions to that, feel free to let me know. Thank you. Um... No more questions have filtered in, filtered in yet, but just a reminder, we will be emailing um, these slides with Michelle's information in case there are any questions that come up later. Michelle, you have, um, this is Chastity, you have a slide here that I just, you know, want to see if you can verbally share it. 
Um, it's the one with keeping a daily vision and intention. And I, I like the, the six points that you put up there. Yeah. They're, they're important for people who are, you know, in the quarantine and there are some people that are negative and then there are some people who think on the positive side. Yeah. Can you, um, can you share what that is? Cause they, they didn't get to see that slide, but I just. Absolutely. Didn't. Absolutely. Chastity. Um, one is to be able to have that intention each day. Sometimes I break it up into morning and afternoon or an evening. Um, but what am I grateful for today? Because we really cannot be grateful and stressed in the same moment. So really focusing on things that um, you are grateful for. Then asking yourself, who am I checking in on today? Who, who can I connect with today? There's so much to be said. I go back to the 12 steps. The 12th step is being doing service for somebody else. There's so much good that happens to us when we reach out to somebody else. And so being able to ask, you know, who am I checking in with? Who am I connecting with today? Because again, we've heard this a lot. It's become cliche. I don't care. I think it's great that social distancing means physical distancing. It doesn't mean social disconnection. You can still remain incredibly emotionally and socially connected to people. So um, being able to ask yourself also, what expectations of normal am I letting go of today? You know, things going back to the question, it's a wonderful one about the guilt. Um, what can I let go of? Um, you can challenge yourself. I, there's somebody that um, did a great Instagram. You don't have to do this on social media, by the way, but it was the letting go challenge. And every day they put in this today, I let go of this. And so being able to ask yourself, what am I letting go of today? How am I getting outside today? If it's safe for, for you to do that, how am I getting outside today? Even if it's for a minute. To me, I say one minute is better than zero minutes. Um, so it's not all or nothing. Um, how am I going to move my body today? A little plug for Peloton. I don't own any Peloton machine, but Peloton has an app that they are um, doing for 90 day free trial right now. I have used it and I strongly recommend that app. I think there's a lot of apps out there, but the Peloton app, you don't need a single piece of equipment for it. They also have daily medita or meditation courses. They have stretching courses, yoga courses, outside courses. So you can do a fun run outdoors with somebody coaching you the whole time, um, walks. They have something for everybody on there. Um, so being able to ask yourself, how am I moving my body today? And then what beauty am I either creating, cultivating, or inviting in today? So it's, it's giving you a really balanced approach to this and using this as an opportunity the best we can. Thank you for asking about that. No, thank you so much. We greatly appreciate it. Um, if if anybody doesn't have any questions right now or they just um, don't want to put them in the chat, you can email myself or Sophia and we can um, filter them out to, to Michelle. I'm actually just turning on my camera here, see if I can get myself on. I can say I invite everybody. But Michelle, thank you so much for, for being on here today. We greatly appreciate you know you taking the time out of your super busy schedule and speaking to us. Um, thank you all for, for being out here on joining us actually uh, today. Please, like I said again, if there's anything that you may think of after this webinar is done, you can shoot myself or Sophia an email and um, we can try to get an answer for you. Um, I was just going to say thank you for bearing with me frozen, freezing up. <laughs> and there's a bad thunderstorm and lightning storm that went over in this last hour. <laughs> so oh, no. I, I'm just glad the power remained on. But um, thank you. I know that could be irritating when watching something like this. So I appreciate it. Hey, it's technology and everybody's in the world of the internet. So we're all slowing things down. But thank you again. And everybody... Stay tuned so, to the Chamber's event calendar and event emails for some more resources and educational presentations such as this um, coming from the Boca Chamber. Again, if you have any questions or you guys need anything, the Chamber's here for you. So I wish you all a wonderful evening. Stay safe, stay healthy, and we'll see you soon. Thanks, guys. Thank you.